All right, with these preliminary remarks, let me now introduce our first presenter, Kasper Reykjavik. Kasper is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo and also maintains affiliation with CEP. He has been researching the foreign fighters, volunteers in the Russia-Ukraine war since 2014 and published widely on the topic, including, of course, with us, CEP. His book on the subject, entitled Brown Red Cocktail, Extremist Foreign Fighters in Ukraine 2014 to 2022, will be published later this year by Routledge. Kasper, thank you so much for being with us today and for all the technical hoops and loops you had to stump to do so. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and the screen is all yours. Thank you, Hans. Thank you for having me. Thank you to CEP and, and uh, hello to, to Alexander and Joshua. It's, it's great to share the stage with you. And it's always good to be back with CEP and, and welcome to the all of our participants who, who actually decided to spend a bit of their July uh, morning or afternoon with us. It's always a, it's always a pleasure to have you and we'll try, I'll try I'll, I'll try my best to be informative and, and entertaining. Uh, let me share my screen. I just have literally a few slides, uh, not too many, because I job as partly you know the scene uh, for the for this discussion to set the scene for this for this webinar. Uh, as I said, I've been looking at this phenomenon for years, and I'll try to put it in a bit of. Kasper, your sound is breaking up really badly. Maybe just turn off your camera. That usually helps a lot. Okay, hopefully this will be better. Um, much clearer, much clearer. So, so essentially, I, I hope you can still see, see my screen. So essentially. Yes, I'll try my best to set it in context. I'll try and put it in the context, especially of 2014, because this is not an entirely new phenomenon. And to some extent, we will see that it's closely connected to what was happening in 2014, and that in 2014, what we're mostly interested in is the is the you know the, the far right, far left, or the extremist individuals who went there. That was you know pretty much pronounced, and we cannot forget about that. So essentially, a couple, really, 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 uh, a quick couple of, of, of slides on that. So I hope uh, it changed, right? You can see the second second slide. Hans, can you can you can just reassure me? Otherwise, I'll have to. No, I can see it absolutely. It's not on full screen, but I, uh, we can see the slides. Right. Okay. So essentially, we're looking at a situation in which I just need to remind remind everyone about the few simple facts that this is something that has been going on since 2014. That's one thing. This is something that has seen travels by people who in 2014 we mostly called fighters now we mostly call them volunteers and i'll get to the situation uh why this has changed so they were traveling to join either side of the conflict so either the ukrainian volunteer battalions or the pro-russian inverted comma separatists so please do remember about that please also do remember about that that if you're looking at the mobilization of 2014 it wasn't as massive as and you couldn't really numerically compare it uh, to the mobilizations for ISIS in, 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 in the earlier years, unless you counted the Russians who fought especially on the pro, and again, inverted comma, separatist side. There were thousands of them, but there was quite a few of the Russians fighting on the Ukrainian side, and please do not forget about that. And lastly, the main point, which is also Askans, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, this will be the title of my book, uh, upcoming book on the issue, Brown Red Cocktail. So essentially, that 2014 mobilization, that was the mobilization, which is full of individuals coming from the extreme right, especially, but also from the extreme left, traveling for both sides, traveling there to join either side of the conflict. They were seen, they were visible. They were also, in a way, I would say, the face of that very mobilization in 2014. The situation in 2022, even though those extremists are still there, quite a few of them, uh, the situation in 20, 2022 is slightly different, and we'll get to that, we'll get to that later. And I think the key point, in a way, as we move on to 2022, is the fact that what I mentioned to you earlier. So we had foreign fighters joining sub-state units, joining irregular formations on either side of the conflict in 2014. So the volunteer battalions or the militias of the other side. In 2022, the main call goes out from President Zelensky, who basically says on the 27th of February, that's three days into the war, you can join our international legion, not foreign legion, the international legion. And you can basically be a part of the Ukrainian military. That's a completely different situation that overnight transforms this mobilization from a foreign fighter one into a foreign volunteer. So essentially, you join not a sub-state structure, but a state structure. 
that is a definitional point that we need to remember about. And also it's a definitional point as far as also the returnee management will be, will be concerned and quite a few other issues. I'm happy to tackle that more in the Q&A Q&A section, but uh, section of the of the of the of the webinar, but please do not forget about that. But essentially, the overall picture, and I just wanted to make really quick five points. Um, at first, you know, I was looking at this since 2014, and when Zelensky came out and said, "Okay, let's have those volunteers," I was skeptical. You know, the, these were the early days of the war; it looked shaky, to say the least, for Ukraine. That was the first thing. It was logistically difficult. I thought to get there, there will not be enough. There wouldn't be enough people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was really skeptical, and it's out there on Twitter when I actually, you know, and I actually put, was putting my skepticism very much to the front. Then I had to eat my hat in a way because then you had all these news saying, you know, 10,000, 16,000, 20,000 people wanted to go. And we can get in the Q and A into the, the you know mechanics and logistics of how this was happening. So I was like, wow, this is going to be bigger. This is going to be way, way bigger than I thought. So I'll humbly had to say, look, I was wrong. But then the funny thing happened that as months were taking by, there weren't that many people as we thought, you know, at some point early on that there, you know, we were going from, from zero to hero. And I'm then not saying that we're going back to zero, but this was a way more humble and smaller group of people that actually made it there and fought in the war. So there is a bit of, you know, an oscillation there from, you know, from a low to a high and then to a slightly, you know, less, less uh, depressing low, if I could put it this way. And again, we can tackle that in more detail. And I think there are three reasons why there was so little, uh, eventually there was so little enthusiasm for, for, for or much less enthusiasm than, if we, when we, than we thought initially there would be for going to Ukraine for three reasons. You know, one is the logistical reason. And I don't mean the logistics in terms of like getting to Ukraine. That was much easier. And I thought it would be for these guys, but the logistics of actually making it to the front. You had to be connected. You had to get to know the right people, be in the right place at the right time, be lucky or make, you know, be able to have some introductions to people so that they would actually get you to the front, get you in gear and kit it out to actually find. It wasn't such a straightforward process. The second, and it, this is, you know, a kind of like a Ukrainian process in a way. I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q and A Q and A sec, uh, section of the of the webinar. Then you have the enemy. I think some of these for some of these volunteers genuinely were convinced that the enemy is like basically ISIS in Iraq. This is this is going to be easy. I'm a former you know fighter. I'm a former volunteer. I'm a former military man. I'm a former marine. We you know we kicked some ISIS butt in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, or whatever, and now we're actually going to do it again. But no actually not. The recollections of these guys of, look, I'm going home because I was shelled, mortared, you know, uh, it was an airstrike on our positions by the Russians, you know, that actually was showing that these guys were clueless as to what they were getting themselves into in quite a few, on quite a few occasions. Thirdly, the third point, and it's a very important point, the attack on the base in Yavorif. Yavorif was the place when quite a few of these fighters or volunteers were facing congregating. This base was bombed by Russia on the 13th of March. This base held the highest component of the then foreign volunteers in Ukraine, around 400 to 500 uh, individuals at the time. But after the bombing and after the chaos that ensued, their numbers really went down. They melted away and relatively few stayed on to actually fight. That's why it actually took the International Legion months to organize and to actually put out what they call the first battalion, uh, what they call the first battalion, which is actually only put out to fight very, very late, which is early June during the fight. You might remember the name around the city of Severodonetsk. That is three, almost three months or two and a half months after the bombing. That's why it actually takes them, you know, this bombing and the ensuing drama, chaos, recriminations, etc., 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 prolong the, let's say, agony of the early phase of this very legion. That's why it takes so much time, and that's why I would claim the numbers are far less impressive uh, than than, individ than we initially thought. So essentially, you get to a situation in which you go, we go down from this twenty thousand. We basically end up with what we call networked individuals. So yes, you can be a foreign volunteer. Yes, you can fight on the front lines in Ukraine, but it's basically bunches of networked individuals who got the right connections, who got the right introductions, who had the perseverance who had the you know, grit to actually go through this whole bureaucratic, senseless hoopla on many occasions and actually deployed themselves in a way with Ukrainian units, with Ukrainian teams to the front. And they act as an appendix. You know, 
legion in itself, you know, you're looking platoon company size uh, unit, but there are groups of individuals here and there scattered around different Ukrainian units, either the territorial defense battalions or the Ukraine, you know, straightforward military units, but they form in teams, you know, they actually act in teams. There's a few of them here and there. That's why we call them networked, in, you know, networked individuals. Then, you know, the proof that there aren't that many of those fighters, you know, you can find it back at home. We do not hear, and I'm not saying that I would like to hear about this, but we do not hear about many casualties. There was recently, most recently, a Swedish uh, volunteer killed in Ukraine. We do not hear about that many casualties uh, on the front lines. We do not hear about that many POWs on the front lines. Yes, they are there, British, American, Croat, etc., 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 but not so many. We do not hear about that many returns, and what is quite important, as you know, especially the Russian MOD, the Russian Ministry of Defense, puts out some fantastical numbers as to the numbers of actually vol actual volunteers who are allegedly fighting there. There is no way you would have these numbers out there. I'll give you an example from like you know the Baltic states. You know, Baltic states have a total population of around six million people, and apparently, according to the Russians, there's like six, uh, there's like fifteen hundred individuals from these countries fighting, and around you know two hundred actually died already. No way that happened, because otherwise we would be hearing of funerals in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia of these individuals. I mean, you can keep the departure secret, you can keep your fight secret, but if you die there, and you know, if you're basically buried with some quasi-military honors and some recognition, no way would we not hear about those funerals. So that's why we need to critically look at those numbers who eventually, or you know, numbers of numbers of people who actually eventually made it made it to the front. And obviously, you know, the last key, key point and a few, you know, few, few issues here, our, uh, you know, our, let's say, customers, if you like, the customers of CEP and mine, uh, the ones that we're actually looking at. So the far right fighters, you know, the, the, the individuals coming from the most extremist milieus, who, for better or worse, rightly or wrongly, Ukraine, the Ukraine, you know, the conflict is quite often associated with the presence of such individuals on the front lines. That is only partly true, and I think the 2020 phase of the 2022 phase of the conflict actually very much supports this notion. Very much, uh, very much uh, actually uh, showcases the fact that it is not only about the far right individuals. So, to walk you through what we mostly had in our report that Hans Hans mentioned, basically we looked at a couple of let's say sectors of couple of communities of individuals who actually were galvanized by the conflict. The first was the influencers. There are far right influencers out there, global, uh, international individuals who have some kind of you know social media pool where they can try to explain the conflict to the to the to the masses, if you like. And obviously, quite a few of them uh, began to row in the in the direction of Ukraine and on its side, not because they suddenly became pro-Ukrainian, but basically they saw what they thought was a lie of the you know alleged traditionalism and then the conservatism of the Putin Russia regime where it was using actually, uh, you know, all sorts of non-conservative troops and non-traditional troops uh, and values to actually explain away the invasion and the attack, the attack on Kiev. I'm sure we can, you know, we can tackle that later uh, in, the, in the webinar. Then the second community that was looking uh, ahead to the conflict was the veterans. You know, like I told you in 2014, there was quite a few of brown, red or brown red, so meaning national Bolshevik people who actually traveled to the conflict and fought there, they returned. They returned in 20, 2022. Either they recruit or they fight themselves. Some of them actually died, and funnily enough, some of them died on the other side. So do not, re, re, you know, do not forget that some of the far right customers of ours fought on the pro Russia, pro separatist side. They returned in 2022, and some of them already died. Actually, probably more veterans died on the pro separatist side than on the pro Ukrainian side. So just, you know, keep that in mind. That's the second. Uh, that is the second. Um, uh, second, uh, let's say, community. The third community is, you know, kind of mini society that mobilizes is the generally the far right of the world that mobilizes for the conflict. You know, they buy humanitarian aid, they buy sometimes tactical gear, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they send it to Ukraine. They send it to their comrades. They send their, send it to their brethren. Yes, that's a worry, absolutely. But at the same time, you could be saying that the way they mobilized, the general society at large mobilized, you know, in the West way more than the far right that contributed way more, uh, you know, per capita. Than those far far right types, which were sending you know aid and gear uh, to their brethren in some of the units in Ukraine, and we can actually, actually also talk about that in more detail later on. What is surprising, you know, to a large degree, what is surprising is that the old hosts of the foreign fighters, 
2014. So groups like Azov, right sector, and others on the far, you know, the Ukrainian far right, they do not deliver in terms of recruitment and fielding and deployment of these fighters. You know, they they go under the banner of the Ukrainian military. They're happy to be there. They're they're happy to be ensconced in the structures of Ukrainian military, Ukrainian military intelligence, Ukrainian territorial defense, etc., etc., etc. And in the process, they lose the vestiges of this globalism or internationalism that they used to have, or transnationalism. They do say it that look, we cannot have you because you do not speak the language, and for operational reasons you will be a hindrance, or we cannot have you because we are now a military structure and military does not take foreigners just like that. It's a lengthy process, etc., etc., etc. Therefore, you have no place with us, which obviously means, and that might be a surprise to some of you, but which obviously means that in this setting, the new challengers appear. So it's not Azov, it's not right sector that actually takes those fighters or volunteers and actually fields them. It's the other units that are actually keen on challenging the bigger ones or actually establishing themselves or convincing us that they're even more important and more cool. To some extent, you might not have heard of something called Battalion, Re something like Battalion Revenge or Battalion Bratstvo Brotherhood or the Carpathian Siege. These groups are more happy to take foul foreigners, they do not ask the questions, they operate mostly through the territorial defense, which is the loosest of all the military formations on the Ukrainian side. They even post their recruiters to the border posts. They take, so they would take the fighters, the incoming volunteers straight from the border to say, hey, you can go with us. You don't have to go through all this bureaucratic hoopla in the city of Lviv. You can go there and uh, you can go with us and, and, and it will all be easier. And to some extent, they're, they're successful with that. Obviously, the assessment of how many they netted, if, you, if, you, if I could put it this way, will probably a few, few months away from that. But obviously, believe us that we're all keeping an eye on that, very, on that very issue. And of course, last but not least, yes, the far right guys are out there. Absolutely. Uh, this has been becoming more evident, especially around the Battle of Severodonetsk, when it suddenly became clear that certain far-right milieu or communities started to eulogize the fallen volunteers, especially from France and Brazil and the US, as their own. And suddenly you started to see that these guys might have gone into the Legion and they went there on the back of their military service and they were accepted, but the vetting probably did not catch their, let's say, ideological or political affiliations from back home. And suddenly you're left with a situation in which these, you know, individuals whom, who were flying under the radar are no longer so much under the radar as the fighters, eventually, the volunteers, they eventually make it to the front. They fight around Kiev in the first month of the war and they are visible. Then they seem to disappear because they have problems with actually getting to the front in the south and in the east. But as we turn to June and as we go into July, they're just a bit more visible. Now, I will not put you know, a number on them so far, but amongst the relatively way smaller than initially thought group of foreigners who are based out there in, in Ukraine, they're just a bit more pronounced than we thought initially, but that's still a minority of a minority. And of course, we need to keep an eye on that. Happy to tackle, you know, happy to take your questions later on. Thank you for the opportunity. Opportunity that was just a, you know just a summary, but as I said, you know, uh, very happy to 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 listen to to your questions and to respond to them. So thank you for the opportunity.